I'm going to talk to you about the 10 things that make entrepreneurs work and be successful. They're 10 conditions. I'll make this presentation available afterwards. But essentially, having left the army just before September 11, spending five years in the world trying to work out which way was up, and then finding my way into a situation where I could build companies and convince people to do stuff they ordinarily wouldn't do, it's led me to build four companies, two of which have gone spectacularly badly, two of which have gone well. The one that I'm building at the moment is going pretty well. And so I'll tell you to talk about that in a second. But I came here today because I wanted to give a little bit of, a little bit of insight back. I wanted to talk to you guys about you know, the, the coalface lessons um, that very often get lost when you hear someone say that they're an entrepreneur. Because it's sexy to be an entrepreneur in Civvy Street now. Right? You see all these people running around, I'm a founder of this, I'm a co-founder of that and everything else. They wear jeans and t-shirts, they run around, they're pitching to people, you know, they got garb and everything else. And that is the over-glamorized perspective of what it takes to build something from nothing. So I want to share with you some of the things that make sense in the world that we have to build products where we have to find a customer, where someone actually has to pull out their wallet and pay you for something, and then for you to do that millions and millions of times over in a really short space of time where people's attention have gone out the window. So I want to make this as interactive as possible. The only, t the only way you're going to get value from this is to probe on any one of these things that don't make sense. And I know that we've got a Q&A session after this, but if something doesn't make sense, if you just want to break it open just a little bit, because I know I'll get in trouble for breaking it out too much, just put your hand up and we'll go for it. Okay? If, I'll leave here knowing that I've landed at least one idea if I get a couple of questions. Um, it's fair, fair to say also that outside of this forum, um, I mentor 21 different founders around the world on building companies. And for this group, I'll extend that offer. Now, I know that there will be maybe one of you that will take that up, but if you need help trying to bring an idea to life, there's something about entrepreneurs who have been through the pain of this a couple of times where we feel as though we're just compelled to sort of pay it forward. So if you want to take me up on that idea, come and see me afterwards. We'll swap details and we'll get, jump on a call next week and I'll see what we can do to help you out. I've got five veterans who are part of that program at the moment and some of them are doing amazing things. So let's get started. Um, I'll just get, oh, this is going to work from here. <coughs> work at all. Okay. I wouldn't be doing my job and I wouldn't be hustling my way through this if I didn't tell you what my current, my current venture was. So we, if you decide to go and build something, whatever that thing is, whether it be as an entrepreneur where you're inside a large organization, whether you're going outside to build something else, you want to make damn sure that you're valuing your time to do that because frankly, you're running out of time. At some point, you're going to pass away and this whole thing, or you'll be on your deathbed and you'll be working out what you did with life and you'll be going, I wonder if that was worthwhile or not. So if you've got an idea you want to try and get across the line now, you apply the time now because you don't know when it's going to come to an end. The venture that I'm building at the moment had to do with journalism, had to do with news, had to do with fake news, had to do with Donald Trump, had to do with Brexit, had to do with the way that people were looking at their phones, watching Facebook and thinking that was news. We went back to what Amazon did with books back in 1994. We went to every news publisher around the world and said, give us your content so we can put it in one place so people can actually see unbiased, no sensationalist news with no clicks, nothing else, so they can just read news and get a handle on what's going on around the world. It's taken us four years, and in four years we've grown this business to take it into 180 countries. You can download Inkle for your smartphone, and you'll get news the best quality news from 50 of the publishers around the world, that you'll instantly recognize the brands. And I've organized it so if you do it from Canberra today, you'll get a 30-day premium trial just by giving it a crack. That's my spiel. I told my team I'd do it. I've done it. Let's move on. So there are 10 reasons why entrepreneurs win. And some of them will be grossly obvious to you because you just go, well, yeah, of course. But some of them won't be. So let's run through them in short order. You might think that resources or things that you need to bring together stakeholders and the like are the thing that is actually the most important currency when you're building something. It's actually not, it's just time. And every founder that has been through the process 
of taking their own money, applying it to something, or taking someone else's money and applying it to something, get very quickly reminded that they are running out of time to produce something with that investment. There is nothing more important in building anything than time. And I appreciate that when you do planning for big projects, that that becomes something which is neither here nor there, right? It can be a program or, a pro or some kind of capability play which is a long 10, 15, 20 year play. But when you come out and you're trying to build something from scratch that people don't know about, you've only got a certain amount of time. And usually, it's about 18 months. And usually, it comes down to how do you manage every single waking minute to optimize for time. So I'm obsessed with time. Our teams are obsessed with time because we've taken someone else's money to build something to try and change a certain part of the world and without having a respect for time, you'll just blow that money up and many people have and those people will never get a chance to build a business again. Entrepreneurs carry with them and entrepreneurs and some of you might be in that, might be in that bucket, they, they carry with them a sense of urgency which is almost borderline annoying. They are so urgent to get to a result and to get to an outcome that they just can't help themselves. And you will see that across all the famous entrepreneurs you know from the Facebook guys right through the people you don't know and who are emerging right now. They just can't help themselves but to be super urgent about delivering stuff. Because the only way that they can learn, sorry, the only way they can move forward is to learn. The only way you can do that is to keep putting things out to people to see if it works out. Who uses Netflix here? Oh, well, I expected. Um, I'm going to ask you a multiple choice question. Netflix this year is A, five years old, B, seven years old, no Googling, or C, 20 years old. Who's for A? Who's for B? Who's for C? And the C's have it. Does anyone know how Netflix started? Is it like a mail order service? Like yeah. DVD? It was, mail order DVD kind of thing. Does anyone have a DVD player <coughs> anymore? They went through four near-death experiences <laughs> to now bring in something north of 160 billion in revenue. But they nearly died four times doing it. These guys had a chance to survive because they were able to navigate through a whole bunch of really crazy times. Imagine if someone comes to you and says, actually, this DVD thing, it's not going to be a thing. But the internet's not fast enough yet because everyone's still in dial-up. So you can't stream anything. What do we do then? Well, you've got to wait. How do you tell an investor that you've got to wait until the internet speeds up? But they did. And now, I would say 80% of this room uses Netflix by default. The only way they knew to hold on to this was to stay the course but be urgent in how they tested. And that's the case for every different company. Did you know there's 10,000 different versions of Facebook running at any given time around the world? Well, you wouldn't know. You just use Facebook. But their engineers are able to go and test anything they want to get data to see if it's going to work. Imagine that capability if you had that in your hands. <coughs> Founders think publicly, which is not to say they come and do what I'm doing here and sort of tell you stuff or speak or espouse. What they do is they don't keep it in their heads. They have mentors, they have teammates, they have family members, they have close buddies, and they take them for a beer or a coffee and say, I've got this really crazy idea. What do you think of this? And it comes out a jarbled sort of thing and people are trying to work out, look at you going, what the hell are you talking about? Until you do it 30 or 40 times, it starts to make sense in your own mind. That narrative starts to come out and people say, actually, yeah, kind of interesting. I would maybe use that. Entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs, force themselves against their better judgment to put it out there. Because the only way you can learn is by getting it from someone else. If you go and build a product and then ship it out to people, good luck. Because how would you ever know that that's going to land? I have never once built a product and then tried to market it. I have always pre-sold. And it has been vaporware. 
It has been hands flowing, it's been websites that don't mean anything, it's been click-throughs to nowhere, it's been all these things. And until somebody pulls out their credit card and clicks on the button that says buy, which by the way, normally would put up a pop-up that goes, kidding, there's nothing actually here, but would you mind if we had a conversation? Which has led to two of the products that we've built which have been miraculous for us. The only way we did that was by talking to people about what we were doing. So if you're not talking, if you've got an idea and you're not talking to people about it, more the folly for you because it's a good chance that it's not gonna go too far. And it, the worst part is it'll stay inside your head. Number four, breaking news. There's no such thing as an original idea. And I'm really sorry to tell you that if you think that whatever you're thinking right now is novel. If you have an idea which you think is novel, unfortunately, and I mean this with the greatest of respect, you don't know how to Google properly. There are people that used to spend and invest a lot of money in venture capital startups because they had an information arbitrage, which is to say that they knew more than the next guy or the next girl. And they could hedge their bets and put money into places which seemed to, seemed to work. Now, the internet gives you everything because we're all vulnerable. We, all, we can all see what everyone's doing. Even if you think you've got the patent, even if you think you've got things that are going on, you see how well things leak out of Apple now, one of the most secure companies in the world. You see how things sort of find their way into different people's hands. The best tip that I can give you that relates to this one top topic, if you've got an idea, give your best friend permission to go and Google for an hour, pay them 50 bucks, and tell them to bring you back whatever they've found. And I guarantee they're gonna bring you back some stuff that you never saw. And does anyone know why that would be the case? Why would they bring you back something that you never knew was there? Because you don't wanna find it. Spot on. Bias. You have a confirmation bias because you're thinking how good your idea is because you've not listened to the point, point before. You've decided to sort of keep it in your own head. But if you give it to someone else, you can short circuit an inordinate amount of pain in your future journey. And it is so worth the 50 bucks. People will always say that networks are essential, and they are. But we network like demons all the time, every opportunity we can. I was even hustling the guy who in the Uber that drove me here today because I wanted to try and get an outcome from him because I knew he knew some stuff about a particular topic when we started talking. We swapped details. We're going to talk when I get back to Sydney because I think there's something there's a deal to be done there. This is not the used car salesman sleazy sort of hustle. This is just the fact that you don't know what other people know, and if you've got value to give to someone else, why wouldn't you give it to them? There's a good chance it's gonna come back to you at some point anyway. But this is not just about sending a LinkedIn request and, say, and hoping to God that someone's gonna go, oh yeah, you're random, I'll accept you. If you're a moron. No one ever exchanges value unless you provide it first. And that's how networks are built. You'll meet people here and you'll have the first conversation and I reckon you'll either go away with a bunch, a stack of business cards or some kind of contact exchange and you will not contact them until some point in the future where you go, oh, there was a guy or a girl I met at that Def Oz thing, I've got to get in contact with them. <coughs> By then it's too late, they've, they've forgotten who you are. If you haven't messaged or got in contact with the people you've met here within 48 hours of this thing finishing, that relationship is as good as cold. <coughs> because you don't know where it's going to pop up again in the future. A side conversation at places like this have led to extraordinary ventures being built. Choose not to take advantage of it if you want to, but I've already met five people here, which I'm very excited to keep on engaging with because I know there'll be something in the future where this is going to play out well, hopefully in Hawaii. You know when someone says to you, you need to improve on these areas. You have a development opportunity. We don't really care about development opportunities and we don't really care about deficits if you're an entrepreneur, a solid entrepreneur. Because the reality is you can buy the deficit. If I'm really good at selling, seriously good at selling, and that's all I'm really good at, I get hired because I'm really good at selling. I might not be a great cultural fit, I might talk too fast, 
I might upset some other staff, but if I sell really well, I can deal with those other things. The problem with people when they come out of an environment like this and they think they go and try and build their own thing outside is they're trying to find an image of themselves. They're trying to find, well, if you bind to my vision, then you must be a bit like me. Therefore, I've got to try and find a person like you or people like you to build out a team. In whose universe has that ever played out? No one's, by the way. The reality is that if you're looking to build something, you find the best strength in the capability you need and you over-index on that, which is to say, really focus on that piece and accept there are limitations, but hire out for those limitations. Otherwise, you're going to be trying to hire for the well-rounded individual. By the way, they don't exist either. Always get double down on strength. Oh, and by the way, you do that because they really enjoy it. Right? If you're going to go and work 20-hour days with some venture somewhere with people you don't really know very well, and you're, you're topping up to plus 100 hours a week, trying to get things out the door, then you want to love what you do. Because when the shit gets hard, you are going to be flying out the door quicker than you, quicker than you know if you are well-rounded. You want to find the best people you can find. You can tell I'm going to start to get a bit emotional about this. Entrepreneurs don't listen to music. No, I'm, I'm kidding, they do. Entrepreneurs plug themselves into any way they can learn that is accessible to them at that time. Books, podcasts, audio books, blogs, uh, YouTube videos, uh, seminars, forums, you name it. Because they have this built-in thing where they just can't, they can't get to the outcome quick enough and they know the only way they can get there is to learn more stuff. Who listens to podcasts? Who listens to audiobooks? Who's on at least maybe, let's call it five mailing lists of somebody that you don't really know, but you sort of signed up because you thought, well, they seem to know what they're talking about. Okay. So remember that there are many people putting out this content and they're doing it because they think what they've learned is going to be valuable to you at some point. It's not all going to be valuable. Right? You, know, you can't read or listen to 60 audiobooks and hope that the whole thing's going to land. But there'll be some things that sort of go, oh, shit, I was trying to solve that problem yesterday. Excellent. Done. But they're doing this while they're doing other stuff. When they're on the commute to work, if they're in the car or whatever else, they've got their headphones in or they're listening in the car, they're listening to a podcast, they're listening to some kind of knowledge base. Now, at some point, they, don't want to, they won't want to learn, they'll just want to listen to music and that's all cool too. But these people are infinite learners. They just can't help themselves. And if you find yourself just interested in something, a topic, then you should do yourself a service of trying to find as much out about that topic as you can. And most of it's free. I used to exercise to music because when I used to hear myself breathe, I used to psych myself out. I used to go, oh, I think my heart rate must be 180. It was like 140. I sort of blow up. So I go, oh, this is too hard. And then I started to listen to what was being said on an audio book or a podcast. And I started to realise that stuff was sinking in as I was going. Not just listening to doof-doof, I was listening to somebody talking about whatever the topic was I was listening to, or what I was listening to. And it was amazing what seeped in. If you don't do it already, try and find a way to learn in a very different way to compared, compared to how you were taught to learn, which is usually through a book or some kind of curriculum. Go freeform. You'll be surprised what you can pick up. Zero to one. They say that it's more, there's a construct in a startup kind of hockey stick. If I say hockey stick, does everyone know what I mean? Just say yes or no. Hockey stick, to say that in some, someone's universe, if you invest in a really great idea, it sort of goes from nothing and then all of a sudden things, you gain traction, sort of kicks up like that, like a hockey stick, right? The hockey stick idea is that it's really difficult to get from zero to one, but when you get to that sort of what they call escape velocity, at the point where things really start to go well, you go from one to N. It's just crazy. Now, of course, everyone thinks that that's, that happens, you know, in five years, which it never does. It happens like in 10 to 15 years. Getting from zero to one is the entrepreneur's challenge. Why do you think it is and not going from one to N? Any takers? Momentum. Kind of. 
Any other ideas? People can see what you're, what you're doing or yourself in there, that's one. They can, but entrepreneurs lose interest at, at that point because they're all about building the thing at the beginning, right? getting it started. That's what really excites them. Once you get to one and beyond, that's a completely different way of running an organisation, right? You've got hundreds of people. I'm just used to sort of running a team of 15. And they don't like it as much. But they're focused on zero to one, which means practically that if you're trying to get someone to use your thing, your app, your program, your book, whatever it is, all you need to do is get to your first paying customer as quickly as is humanly possible. Now, I know that doesn't, that's not relevant for many of you here where you're not trying to do that on a day-by-day -day basis. But think of the other type of analog to that. Getting your first stakeholder to buy in for a particular piece, getting to your first milestone, whatever that is, regardless of the project timeline. This is my measure. If I can get someone to pay me a dollar in 30 days, I know I'm onto something. If I can't, then I'm not sure I've worked hard enough on the idea. And maybe the idea's just shit house. So I can just can it. But the reality is, that's the beginning. That's the very, very beginning from zero to one. And zero to one is super important because without that sort of velocity to get started, you're going nowhere. And what you've just done is you've just sunk time, the time you didn't have. Okay. Failure. People freak out at failure. I love seeing people get really upset about failure. And there's obviously two types of failure. There's terminal failure, where someone dies, and that is not good. And then you have failure because someone, something didn't work as expected. And people feel as though they've got some kind of thing built up, their reputation's now at risk, or something's gone wrong and it just failed. And you've got all these sort of tree huggers types that sort of come along and just go, embrace failure. You're on the other side of the bank going, yeah, my boss doesn't pay me to fail, pal. But here's the thing. Every single lesson is actually born of failure, whether it was worked well or worked, or worked differently. If you think for a second that you can get out of building something from scratch without any kind of failure, you are delusional at the highest order. And all it takes is to rethink what it actually means to fail at something. It's a shame that most people can't realise there's a learning in every failure, but the reality is that if you are the entrepreneur, if you're the guy or girl running the show or getting something off the ground, you set that standard. So as soon as you roll your eyes, metaphorically or actually roll your eyes, when somebody doesn't stand up to something, as soon as you've done that, you've set the standard. And no one will walk past that standard. They will essentially go, if I do something like that again, I'm fucked. Because my boss just set that standard. So if you are ever thinking about whatever standard is going to be, you should just go, instead of saying, well, instead of sort of exuding some kind of disappointment, it's just so, what did you learn? I'll be pissed if you can't tell me what you learned. But I'll be pretty happy if you can tell me you learned something, because there's a good chance I'll learn something as well. This is what the best entrepreneurs do. The worst ones don't know how to deal with it. And so what they do is they point fingers. But there are managers that do that too. And the final one. There is always a way. Always. And if you think that there's not, it's probably because you're just tired. <coughs> there's always a way. There is a principle called Occam's Razor. Has anyone heard of Occam's Razor before? What does Occam's Razor mean? How often do we sort of wrap ourselves up in a solution that sort of, it just, it, yes, it's going to work out perfectly if I can spin a thousand plates, it'll be fine, and then all of a sudden, pfft, happens all the time. The best antidote to getting wound up that you can't find a way beyond being tired is Occam's razor. Because if you take, if you take a step back, if you bring your mentors in, if you bring the people who are outside of your situation into it, they will very quickly show you what the way is. And as soon as they say it, you go, oh, yeah. How did I miss that? They are the top 10 things that make entrepreneurs win. I can tell you from experience, I can tell you from the people who have been on my podcast to tell me how they've won, and there is gross consistency between those 10 things and people who have done things in the world which you'll never know about, 
but which are extraordinary because they've already been subsumed into other big things. It begs the question, though, doesn't that just mean you just work harder? I mean, surely if I just spend the next, you know, 18 hours of a day doing stuff and activity, I'm going to get there. Right, right. Sure. So here's the kicker. And here's why most of you are really well positioned to be entrepreneurs. It's actually innate in the training you've already received. But before we go into that kind of situation, when somebody asks, what is your key advantage when you start something new as an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, it's the fact that you have a work ethic that will take you into the teens, high teens, of work per day. It's not the volume, it's the work ethic that sits behind it. So when you hear somebody say, oh, I was working, you know, got into work at seven, finished work at seven, big day, yes, big day. That is a big day. For most people, that's a big day. But if you're really interested and you really love what you do and you've gone from 7 a.m. because you went to bed at 2, because you were still moving through, and I get for people who've got kids, a la me, and many of you, you won't be able to do things like that. That's just not practical. The work ethic is the thing that makes the biggest difference, but it's not the only thing. As it turns out, it's only 25% of the game. You only need these four things in addition to the 10 behaviours we talked about before. How simple is this? You just got to work hard. Yeah, okay, good, got that. It doesn't mean you've got to work all the time, but it means you've got to put in the time, because if you don't, nothing's going to happen. You must ship imperfection, which is to say, whenever you get to version one of whatever it is you're doing, it must go out that door. And it might fall on deaf ears, and it might fall on to people who sort of go, I'm actually pretty embarrassed about what I'm about to show you. But if you don't, and then you wait to ship something which is near, in your view, perfect, you will come flying to the, the earth with the greatest of thumps. Because everything you've done to that point is all up here, and every assumption you have in your brain about any idea you have right now, I guarantee you, is wrong. Why? Because it wasn't designed for the real world. It was designed for your fantasy land. And your fantasy land is a good place to be because it helps you have ideas and helps you get to a certain point. But as soon as you road test that idea, most people sort of get overwhelmed by the feedback that they don't know how to accept that says, sorry, it's just I would never use this. I mean, what the hell have you been spending your time on? You need to get it out and be embarrassed early. It gets easier, trust me. But the reality is, if you don't get it out sooner, you will be disappointed. The third one is just being organised. You know how simple this is? Who, who exercises first thing in the morning? Really? I know that many people. Everyone exercises sort of d about daily, right? No? Okay, who exercises weekly on average? Who does more than weekly? Okay, good, that's fine. Wait there for a second. Um, being organised means that when you wake up, whatever your morning routine is, I'm not going to get into morning routines and yoga and all the stuff that people are talking about at the moment, all you need to do is write down on a pad and a pen, not on your device, the three things you want to achieve in the day. How ridiculously, insanely simple is that to do? Try it for a week and see how that changes what you achieve in a day. If you choose not to do that, just keep doing what you're doing, it's fine. But see what the difference is. The fourth part, of course, is using judgment. But using judgment isn't just about sort of your gut feel. It goes back to the second point. The second point is to get someone else's point of view so you can make a judgment. Don't be lulled into a false sense of security that your judgment by itself is the best judgment. It's good, but it'll only take you so far because as soon as confirmation bias kicks in, Judgment becomes very, very bad very, very quickly. So this is where I wanted to leave it, except to say one other thing. 
most people, militaristically, really enjoy learning by reading. Gross generalisation. This is the single most important book of the last two years for anyone contemplating building something inside or outside an organisation for you to either buy to read or get to listen to. The Hard Thing About Hard Things was written by a guy called Ben Horowitz. Ben is a guy who is now a very famous venture capitalist but was able to well, basically had to build, build a software company. It blew up spectacularly. He had to list with a really small amount of money in the bank before dot-com one happened in 2000. He was able to maneuver the company all the way through, get his team to rally, and ended up selling it for 1.6 billion. Only a short time later, a couple of years. And he goes into intricate detail about the hard thing about hard things. Not just sort of, I did this and I did that. He documents the learnings and the lessons that he's taught at everywhere around the world for entrepreneurs to get their heads screwed on right. I think it costs like 14 bucks. If you're looking for something to take away from this, hopefully some of what I've told you has landed, but grab that book, because it will really open your eyes. I'd like to just do a quick show of hands. Who learned absolutely nothing during that? Ooh, no, that was a hand down. Okay, good, sorry. <laughs> she was nearly at an auction. Where she, Did you just bid? That's a million dollars. Oh, no, don't do that. I'm pleased, and I hope you, I, I, I'll take that as being generous. But it's not rocket surgery, right? This stuff. It really isn't that difficult. But you've got to want to love it. So as I say to anyone who's contemplating an idea, there are only two indicators to tell you that you're on to something that you really want to do. I'm going to share them with you now. This is the first one. When your brain floats off to a space, when you're just distracted and it just sort of floats off to wherever it floats off to, which hopefully didn't happen too much during this presentation, but let's just say it did, Wherever it floated off to, there will be, if you look back at the last 10 times you did that, a very consistent place where that went. It could have been you've gone to surfing, it could have been you went to flying, it could have been you went to reading or gone to a beach, whatever. Skiing? Maybe skiing? No. Wherever you've gone to, that is actually the place you should be trying to make money from. Step two, if you have the courage to take the idea and run with that idea and you say, I would just love to go and do something really cool in Hawaii that relates to surfboards because that's what I really, really, really want to do. But I'm not going to tell anyone because it's not part of my job. If you notice yourself telling this to your partner or to a close friend, and you feel that you sort of sit up a bit straighter because you just get a bit cheated up by it, that's your confirmation right there. If you're going to sink time into anything in your life, beyond family and everything else, that has to do with the venture, use those two steps. Because if you don't, and if you're going into it because you think it's a nice thing to do or some alternative to what you're doing right now, I'm sorry, but I don't think it will go very well. My name's Phil. I want to extend to you an offer to help you if you've got thinking you want to do. Please come and see me after this, but it's been a real pleasure. I'm going to hand over to two very capable guys to talk to you about some stuff that comes from the Netherlands. So uh, handing over, guys.